Hello everyone, it's February 10th here in the Valley of the Heat Stroke and you know what that means. That's right, it's the first full week of pitchers and catchers for spring training 2014. Now right off the bat, I have to explain why this video footage displays 2012 in the background and the answer for that is quite simple. Last year, I decided I would no longer purchase consoles for my gaming experience, due in large part to having such a powerful PC for work tasks. I just couldn't justify gaming on consoles anymore because my experience on the PC was just so much greater in regard to visual appeal and frame rates, etc., as well as a lack of console exclusive titles, by and large. Now, having said that, I'll point out that the game I'm using to provide simulation is one of those exclusive titles. However, last year when I checked out the 2013 version, I decided it just wasn't enough of a difference from the previous year's version, so I didn't purchase that one. But now here we are with the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One being released, and it's time to make that decision again. Frankly, I still don't think either console is going to perform as well as the PC system I'm running. But again, I find myself with the dilemma of whether or not to invest in one because of title exclusiveness. A decision made easier by the fact that the 2K series has been discontinued. There is another title coming from the makers of the show, MLB The Show, but that's not scheduled for release until April 1st, and mental note, that's April Fool's Day, so that might not be an accurate report either. In any event, in order to prepare for this season, starting now as the players report, I decided to use the simulator I had on hand to present these video reports, and I'll cross the console decision bridge in April should I find it necessary. So now, without further ado, let's talk Arizona Diamondbacks baseball. Alright, Trevor Cahill. Trevor started 25 games last year, with some work down in the minors after being placed on the disabled list in late June, early July. He was getting, uh, it was a hip contusion. He was getting hit from line drives a little bit there in that time. He also kind of tweaked his pitching shoulder, so they sent him down for three or four games. Basic stats from last year were less than expected, to say the least, compared to his progression to that point. He really was the one-two guy. He, I thought he was going to be the number one guy against Kennedy earlier in the year, but who knows how he's going to start this year. Having said that, I'm sure there's going to be a place for him in the starting rotation this year as well primarily because I expect to improve on his ground out style of pitching this spring. He ends up throwing mainly sinkers of 88, 89 miles an hour consistently. It doesn't vary very much. And his off speed comes in at 77 or 78. So that 10 mile an hour drop is pretty significant. And speaking of drop, it drops pretty significantly too. the off speed, sometimes hitting the ground well in front of the plate, but that doesn't stop batters from swinging at it anyways. However, if the opposing team gets to him early and he's just not getting the ball down in the strike zone, he can give up some big innings. Hopefully he'll return to his more successful form this year and avoid injuries to get his numbers back up above 500. Last year he went a mere 8 and 10. Also, hopefully he'll get his ERA down closer to 3 than 4. Last year he was at 3.99 to finish the season. Because I think the team will be able to put up three or four games, or I'm sorry, three or four runs themselves this year. With Cody Ross returning, the addition of Trumbo, enhancing the lineup and protecting Goldschmidt a bit, or vice versa. We'll see how Coach Gibson goes with it. I'd like to see that. Cahill's whip last year wrapped up at a 1.42, but unfortunately they seemed to come in the same innings and early, as I said before. He did manage 102 strikeouts last year. But that's not really how he gets his outs as a starter anyways, as I discussed previously. He's a ground ball pitcher. Sinker ball pitcher gets a lot of ground outs. Defensively, he has a short rear kick, and it's centered and set to receive as the ball crosses the plate, which is helpful because, again, with all the sinkers and off-speed stuff he throws down across the bottom third or lower, he gets a lot of choppy contact scattered across the field. When watching a game with Cahill, you shouldn't be surprised to hear a lot of semi-solid contacts that turn into routine grounders. And you shouldn't be too concerned if someone gets on first because of how frequently those same grounders can be turned into two. Unfortunately, I got to the ballpark for only one of his games last year, and it was an injury game. But what I saw that day was remarkable nonetheless, because let me tell you about Josh Colmenter. Josh performed exceptionally in his role as middle to long relief last year, including the game I was at wherein he came in during the second, I believe, to spell an injured Cahill and ended up throwing a 
gem of a game. Josh comes at the batter with an over-the-top 12 o'clock delivery straight over the top, which results in a somewhat high rear leg kick, causing him to fall off slightly to his left. But his speeds reach high 88, 89 on the regular, and his off-speed comes in at about 10 miles an hour slower. He also has a straight-up fastball that clocks in around 91, 92 if he really gets himself pumped up. That tends to uh, float up towards the top of the strike zone from belly to chest, and the batter just can't lay off of it. Josh isn't afraid to throw high strikes sometimes above the belly, but close enough to be too enticing not to swing at, typically too late for the batters, jamming them up a bit into some towering pop-ups. Fortunately, Chase Field isn't an elevator shaft and reaches as far as 413 feet of playable space in some areas, so they just turn into nice tall pop-outs. Josh appeared in 49 games last year without a start, but still managed to acquire five wins along the way giving up only eight home runs and 92 innings of work. Josh held his season ERA to 3.13, dipping as low as 0.50 in June. Coleman finished the season with a whip score of 1.22, but what I really enjoyed about watching him at the ballpark was knowing that he could get you a strikeout nearly every inning, with 85 total during his 92 innings of work. Defensively, he doesn't appear to get into position quickly enough on his heat, that tends to induce those pop flies and strikeouts I was telling you about. But since he's still moving when the contact does happen this way, he uses his momentum well in transitioning. Inheriting runners often, he knows his way around the ball field well on any given contact and is quick to get into position behind home if a play is anticipated. There was some talk of Josh possibly getting into the starting lineup, but with the acquisition of Bronson Arroyo, I expect him to maintain his long to middle relief role. And frankly, it's difficult to keep somebody in that position when they're that good, but he is that good at doing it. You'd hate to give it up. Getting another starter that might be able to go six to eight innings is all well and good, but if something goes wrong, there's now nobody in the bullpen that can take care of the second or third inning relief. But we'll see. It's still early in spring, and who knows how things are going to shake down. So that's Josh Colmenter and why I'll be keeping an eye on him this year.